So have you ever met someone who was like their own worst enemy? You ever, you ever met somebody like that? Like you ever seen somebody doing something and you're thinking, uh-oh. It's, it's almost like watching a car wreck in slow motion where you suddenly know the future or, or seeing like a small child pulling something and pulling something down on themselves. You ever see somebody doing that with a part of their life? But, and, and you know what's about to happen and you see it coming, like the choices they're making or just the way they make choices or the things that seem to just keep happening to them in their lives. Have, have you ever known someone who is their own worst enemy? Have you ever been that person? Yeah, yeah, I have. In fact, I think we all have the capacity at times to be our own worst enemy in one or more parts of our lives. And something I know about you, and I might not even, I you know, might not, not know you at all, but I actually know this about you, and I know this to be true about you because it's also true of me. Check this out. You have participated in all your bad decisions. Isn't that true? Like you are the common denominator behind every dumb thing you've ever done. And so was I. Like, we are the masterminds behind our own worst moves. So, like, pat yourself on the back. Congratulations for that. But here's why that's really important. Because a single bad decision is always a first step toward becoming your own worst enemy. A single bad decision is always like a first step towards becoming your own worst enemy. In fact, research shows that a single bad self-betraying decision actually makes the next one far more likely. In fact, we might dive into a little bit of that research next week in part two of the series, but every self-destructive, every self-sabotaging outcome always began with a first decision, a first bad decision. Every habit begins with the first time, every journey begins with the first step, and taking that step always makes the next step more likely. And so, since we all have the capacity to be our own worst enemy, and since we are usually becoming our own worst enemy before we even know it, right? How do we keep from becoming our own worst enemy? And that is the question we're going to be trying to answer over the next few weeks. Over this, the next few weeks of this series, we're going to be talking about three preemptive habits. Preemptive habits, because we are becoming our own worst enemy before we even realize it, we need to talk about things that happen before we're becoming our own worst enemy. Three preemptive habits that will ensure that you will not be your own worst enemy. In fact, my guarantee for you of this series, in fact, it's a money back guarantee. Okay, the series is free, but the guarantee is this. If you you will do these three things consistently, you will never be your own worst enemy. And in fact, you might become your own best friend. And the first preemptive habit is this one. Preemptive habit number one is play the movie. Preemptive habit number one is play the movie. And I want you to say that out loud with me real quick. What's preemptive habit number one? What is it? Uh, one more time just to get it into us. Preemptive no habit number one play the movie. There's an old story. It goes back to a bygone era of things like newspapers and wristwatches. Some of you remember those days. There's an older gentleman who finds his usual seat on a park bench at lunchtime and opens up his newspaper to read. It's like his daily routine. He loves it. The sound of birds chirping, children playing. And a young man comes and sits down on the bench next to him, dressed in a nice suit, opens up a paper as well. And the two sit there in silence for a while reading. When the young man looks over at the older gentleman and says, excuse me, sir, do you happen to have the time? And the older gentleman looks back at him, kind of gives him the up and down, right? And says, nope. Goes back to reading his newspaper. Well, the young guy's a little bugged by this because he can tell the man is wearing a watch. So he stews on this for a second and then he finally says, I'm, excuse me, sir, I hate to bother you, but I can see that you're wearing a watch. Why won't you tell me the time? Have I done something to offend you? And the older gentleman looks back at him and says, nope. Goes back to reading his paper. So now the young guy really is bugged and he says, well, the, then help me understand. Why won't you tell me what time it is? And the older gentleman sighs and puts down his paper and says, listen, when you came and sat down next to me, I noticed you. You seem to be a nice enough young man dressed in a fine suit. You must work in one of the upscale businesses around here. You're reading the Wall Street Journal, which tells me you care about things like the world and, and current events. 
and, and, and you seem like you would be an interesting person, and I was impressed, and then you asked me for the time. And I knew that if I gave you the time, we would probably start talking, and you would tell me a little bit about yourself, and I would probably like you. And then if we saw each other here again at lunchtime, we would probably talk more, and we would become friendly, and then if we became friends, I would probably want to invite you over to my home to meet my family, and you would meet my wonderful daughter whom I love, and being such a nice young man, she would probably like you, and being as wonderful and as beautiful as she is, you would definitely like her, and you would become friends, and then you would ask her out on a date, and... If you went on a date, you would probably fall in love and you would want to marry her. And I'll be hanged if I'm going to allow my daughter to marry a man who doesn't own a watch. <laughs> Play the movie. Play the movie. Play the movie. Playing the movie means as I consider choices and options, opportunities, obligations that are coming up in my life, I never just see the individual choice as it is in front of me, but I will play this out to the end as part of this, this longer arc over a period of time, the longer story of my life, the future implications of it. Playing the movie, playing the movie begins with something called the law of cause and effect, uh, which is like every action has an equal and opposite, what is it? Reaction, right? It's if A, then B. The law of cause and effect, just understanding and honestly believing, and that's where the glitch is, I think, for some of us sometimes, uh, understanding that if I do A, then B is going to happen. It's the law of cause and effect, but playing the movie actually goes beyond the law of cause and effect, the simple law of cause and effect, to something that might be called the ripple effect, uh, because B is actually the first in a much longer chain of causes and effects, and in fact, once B happens, it becomes its own cause now, and, and it will, these are called second order effects. Once B happens, well, then that's going to create C which is then going to cause D, and then E, and then F, and eventually P, and W. It, in other words, all the way to the end, it's not just the immediate effect singular that I'm trying to think about, but it's the ultimate effects, plural, as this choice ripples out, not only into the future of my own story, but the future stories of others around me. It's the Law of unintended consequences. You ever hear that phrase, the law of unintended consequences? It's the unintended consequences. I didn't mean for that to happen. I didn't, I didn't mean for that. I mean, I wanted B, so I did A, but I never wanted F to happen, and I never even considered that P might happen. I didn't see, I didn't realize that B was actually distantly connected to a whole number of outcomes that would be triggered when I chose A, I didn't play the movie. I didn't play the movie all the way to the end. Playing the movie means I never see any individual action as if it were an isolated thing in and of itself because it never is. I never see any individual action as if it's this isolated thing in and of itself because any one thing I do, any one thing you do is really a scene in a much longer movie, a much longer story, and it's the story of your life. And in order to understand that action, you've got to play it out all the way to the end of the movie. How does the story like this end? How does something like this play out? Where does this last domino land? And wise people do this all the time. Wise people think this way all the time about every facet of life, their business life, their financial life, their personal life, their spiritual life, their relationships. They're thinking this way all the time that every behavior, every decision is actually a step in a direction and, and it's a part of this longer chain and every direction has a destination and I'm going to play that to the end to see where this might go. Now, this whole idea of playing the movie is actually deeply rooted in one of the basic principles in a document in the Hebrew scriptures uh, that's really like a how not to be your own worst enemy handbook. It's called the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is this collection of wisdom. It's like a wisdom primer found in the Hebrew scriptures. And the foundational assumption of this whole collection of wisdom known as the Proverbs is simply this. We call it the path principle, that your direction determines your destination. Your direction determines 
your destination. It's the path principle. Uh, how many of you have ever driven uh, up the PCH, up through Big Sur towards Monterey, towards B the uh, Bay Area? Anybody ever driven that road, PCH? It's, I mean, it is a beautiful drive, am I right? If you have the time, if you are not in a hurry, because it is slow moving, but it's one of the nicer roads in all of California. But here's the deal. If you pack up your swimsuit and your sunscreen and your golf clubs for a wonderful weekend vacay in Palm Springs and then hop on the PCH going north, you will never get to Palm Springs. You plan for it. You told all your friends about it. You made reservations. You told the kids. They're all hyped. You took selfies of yourself in the car on the way. No, no, duck lips. Post that on your Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat. Headed to Palm, like hashtag Palm Springs, right? You even prayed for travel and mercies. Oh, Lord, help us get to Palm Springs safely. So excited about Palm Springs. And then you get on the PCH and head north. You will never get to Palm Springs. And when you end up in Monterey hours, many, many hours later, upset and confused, like, how did this happen to me? I don't understand how this happened. God, why did you let this happen to me? The nice, smart people of Monterey will tell you it's simple. You went the wrong way. You went the wrong way. See, the way you went goes here, not Palm Springs, every time. Every single time, it always goes here, not there. It doesn't matter what you intended. It doesn't matter what you thought it would be, what you hoped. It doesn't even matter what you prayed for. The path that you got on goes to the Bay Area, not Palm Springs, every single time. The path determines your destination all the time, not, by the way, your intentions, not your hopes and dreams and your expectations and your prayers and your wants. The path determines your destination. And this is one of the most foundational ideas in the book of Proverbs, that every decision is actually a step on a path. Every path has a destination, and you, you can choose your path. But you cannot choose its destination or change its destination. The only way to change where you're going is to change direction. So choose your path wisely. Now, there's a scene early in the book of Proverbs that illustrates this really powerfully. In the scene, the scene opens with this wiser, older gentleman who's standing at a window and he sees something that's happening and he already knows how it will end up because he's playing the movie and he sees someone who's being their own worst enemy and they don't even know it yet. And so he narrates his thoughts. And as he does, he illustrates this principle, the past principle, but also this habit of playing the movie. Here's how he narrates the story. Proverbs 7, 6. At, at the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice and I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who lacked Judgment. So he's standing in the upper room of his home and he's looking out on the street and he sees a group of young men who he refers to as simple. Now, sim the person who's simple in the book of Proverbs is related to somebody who's a fool, but a fool in the book of Proverbs is somebody who's intentionally, like knowingly self-destructive, been there, done that. The simple is a little different. The simple person is, they're just naive. They're ignorant. They don't know they're dumb. They don't know what they don't know. They don't realize what they're doing. They lack judgment. They lack good decision-making skills. They're not able to play the movie, if you will. And this simple young man, he's headed down a path. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along the direction, or literally walking in the way of her house at twilight, as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in. Now, you don't have to be a Bible scholar, and you don't have to be a fortune teller to know where the story is going, right? You can play this movie, you can, and, the, and the man in the window can play this movie. And what's interesting is this young man, he's walking down this path, like hormones pumping, sun is setting, and the soundtrack playing in his head is like, party like a rock star. I mean, this is a beautiful night to be alive, and he's young, and he's amped. But the older man in the window, here's a completely different soundtrack. It's the theme to Jaws. Ba -na. He's walking down the path. Ba -na. And so the reason we're going to see is that the wise man, 
knows the path principle and he knows how to play the movie and the kid is thinking, the kid's thinking, this is an isolated event. This is just a night. It's just a weekend. It's just spring break. It's just an isolated event. But the older man knows, no, this is a path. This is actually a path and it's a path with a predictable destination. See, the older man knows this. Every decision is a step in a direction. Every decision is a step in a direction. There are no isolated events. There are no one-offs. Everything we do, every action, every choice is actually part of a path. Now, we don't generally think of our lives this way. We, we often think of our lives very much as just one single solitary event after another. And like, for example, we've all made uh, the financial decisions, probably many of our financial decisions thinking, well, this is just a decision. I mean, this is just a one. I mean, this is just a thing. This isn't a path. It's a purchase. This isn't a path. It's an iPhone. This isn't a path. It's a car lease. This is the path. It's a monthly payment. But here's the thing. Every decision that you make is actually part of a path, a financial path that you've been on your entire life. And if you add up all of those decisions, you end up, well, where you are. And if you begin to play that out further, you can actually tell where you're going to be. Proverbs 14, 15 says this, the simple believe anything. I'll figure out how to pay for it later. You know, I usually get a bonus at the end of the year. I'm not going to be doing this job forever. I'm going to get a better paying job next year. I'm going to be able to afford this. You'll see it'll all work out. The simple believe anything. They believe anything they want to believe. But the prudent, the wise person, the thoughtful person, no, they give thought to their, what is it? Steps. They give thought to their steps. Why? Because those steps are taking me in a direction, on a path that has a destination. And if I follow those steps out, I can see where I'll end up. And I didn't want to ever end up there. I want to end up here, so I need to change my direction. Now, back to our story, verse 10. So the woman comes out to meet him, dressed like a prostitute, dressed seductively, though she's not a prostitute, as we'll see. With crafty intent, she took hold of him and kissed him and with a brazen face, face said, I have fellowship offerings at home. Ooh, what? Fellowship offerings. Here's, here's what she's saying. Now, a fellowship offering was part of a meat that was part of a, an offering that would have been sacrificed at the temple. Today I have fulfilled my vows. So the, she, would, she had brought a sacrifice to the temple and in a fellowship offering, the fattiest part of the meat would be offered as a fragrant sacrifice to God. And then a part of the meat would be given to the priest and the, the, the uh, person bringing the sacrifice would then take the rest of the meat home with the idea that they would eat that as with others, like in a celebration, as an act of worship. And so she's saying, I've got, I've got this meat in my house and, and, you know, God doesn't want me to eat alone. And meat was rare. I mean, meat is a luxury. So she's like, I've got, I, God doesn't want me to eat it alone. Do, do you think? Now, this is the, the scariest part of the story to me. This part of the story is really scary to, me because, scary to me because here's the thing. You and I can talk ourselves into and out of just about anything. Isn't that true? You and I can sell ourselves uh, anything. You and I can talk ourselves into and out of just about anything. And we can actually use God and religion to justify it, to do it. Well, God just, I believe God wants me to be happy. You know, God, God, I know this is probably not what God would want me to do, but, but he'll forgive me. He'll bring something good out of it. God doesn't want me to eat alone. And, and by the way, if you're not, really a Christian or you're not really sure you think of what you think about this whole God faith Bible thing and you've seen Christians do this or religious people do this this, this for you this is like one of the things you hate about Christians and religion is speak it's like Christians using God talk to cover over their hypocritical you know choices this is one of the reasons maybe why you've struggled to actually be one and if that's where you're at I just want to say Jesus could not agree with you more. Like on that point, you and he are in the very same boat. Do not miss the series we're kicking off in two weeks where we are deep diving into the story of Jesus. It just might surprise you. But back to our story, verse 15. So she says, I've got fellowship offerings at home. I fulfilled my vows. I'm good with God. We've were, I, I've been forgiven. And, and, you know, 
I, I've worked things out and now I'm good. And so I have come out to meet you. And I have looked for you and I found you. And he's like, dude, she wants me. She wants me. I'm the man of her dreams. I'm special. I'm too sexy for my shirt. Like she can't get enough of me. I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deeply of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. Let's have fun with love. Let's have fun with sex because it's just recreational. It's just like a game that people play. Let's play with our soul's ability to form intimate attachments to others. Let's just play a few games with that. Then she has this, my husband is not at home. He's like, well, I kind of figured that. Thank you for removing that final obstacle from my path. Like, thank you for that. He's gone on a long journey. He took his purse, his money bag. So her husband is actually a merchant. Which, and merchants in the ancient world would often be gone for long periods of time, closing deals, making deals. He's gone on this business, business trip. In other words, she's saying, this is risk-free. No one's going to find out. We will never get caught. Nothing bad could come from this. And with persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. And all at once, he followed her. But of course, there's nothing really all at once about this. There's nothing all of a sudden about it. It's a path. It's a path, and it's a path that he's actually been on for a while, a way that he began to take a while back, and the older, wiser man could see that from the very beginning, that he was on a path, but now his path has reached a critical point, and he's thinking, I'm like a celebrity. I'm like a, I'm like a rock star. I'm a stud, and the old man is saying, no, you're prey. No, no, this is going to be, this is like a dream come true. This is going to be like one of these weekends of my life where I will, you know, I'm going to brag to my friends about this. What could possibly ever go wrong with this? And the older man is saying, no, you are your own worst enemy and you don't even know it. You don't even know it yet. All at once he followed her like an ox going to a slaughter. He's like, wait, wait, what? No, 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 no. I'm like a celebrity walking into a nightclub. What are you talking about? No. Like an ox going to a slaughter, like it's a beautiful day, it's great to be alive, who cannot see it coming like it's any other day until suddenly the club comes down on his head, the blade reaches across his throat, he's bled out, butchered and devoured. That's what you are. Wait, you, you, didn't, you didn't get that metaphor? Let me throw another one at you. Uh, like a deer... Beautiful day, grazing in this wonderful little pasture, steps into a noose till an arrow pierces his liver like a bird, darting around looking for food, right into a snare, little knowing, little knowing that it'll cost him his life, unaware. And the wiser older man, he's playing the movie. He's playing the movie. He's like, this is how that story ends. Not maybe tonight, not maybe tomorrow, and maybe not literally, but this is how that story ends. This is where that path goes. And then the wise man pulls back from his narration, and he addresses his sons, and he addresses us, and he says, listen, listen, listen. There is a huge lesson to be learned here. Listen, my sons, pay attention, like clue in, like listen, listen, listen to what I say next. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. And so now this is no longer about some simple young guy and a seductive woman. She's actually become this symbol in the story for a whole way of approaching sexuality. And it's a path. It's a path and it's a path with a predictable end to which the young man or we might say, well, how do you know that old guy in a window? How, how do you know where this path goes, Mr. Judger McJudgerson? Like, what do you think you know about this path? Next word, many. Many. Many are the victims she has brought down. Buddy, this is not a unique situation. You are not that special. Well, I've never felt this way before. No, but a lot of other people have. A lot of people, a lot of other people have. This is common. 
This is a path. There is a way this turns out. Her slain are a mighty throng, bigger, smarter, richer, more powerful, more savvy people than you have been brought down by this particular path. The tabloids and talk shows are filled with stories of the sexually stupid. Her house is a highway. It is a highway, four lanes, well-traveled path leading not to where you think it's going, but leading to the chambers of death. In other words, here's what he's saying. This destination is predictable. You can play this movie forward. Paths are predictable. Paths are predictable because you're not the first one. I'm not the first one to ever travel this path. Jesus once said, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many people find it. In other words, lots and lots and lots of people have figured out ways of blowing up their lives or parts of their lives, burning things down and destroying them all around themselves. It is not new. It is a well-traveled path. It's like a movie that you've seen before, even though you haven't seen a movie, the movie, right? And so it's like, hey, have you seen this movie before? No, no, I don't think I've seen that. Well, let's watch it like two to three scenes in, you're like, oh, I know how this movie ends. Oh, how do you know? Have you seen it? Well, no, I mean, not this version of it, but yeah, I've kind of seen this movie. They changed around a couple of the characters. There's a little tweak here and there, but I know how this movie ends. I can play this forward. It's why, this is why, and isn't it funny, when we see someone being their own worst enemy, we kind of know how the story ends, or, or, or we hear their story, and, and maybe you've had this experience, I bet we all have, where, where you've got a friend or you've got somebody you care about, it's heartbreaking, it's heartbreaking, and they're telling you their story, and they're so depressed, and they're so angry, and they're so confused, and they're so shocked, I don't see how I ended up in Monterey, this makes no sense to me, and then she said, and then I said, and then we went, and then he left me, and I can't believe he left me, and you're thinking, honey, he was leaving you the day he met you, like we all knew that. That's who he is. And you've had this thought, and you would never say this because you're, you're a nice person, because your heart's breaking and my heart's breaking, but here's the thought you've had. Tell me if you've had this thought before. Well, you should have seen that coming. You ever have that thought? You should have seen that coming. You could have seen that coming. Why didn't you see that coming? It's not like you have a magic crystal ball or you're some kind of fortune teller. You're just playing the movie. You're just playing it out, and the outcome seems predictable, like, oh, honey, this does not end well for you. If you don't change direction, this path does not end well for you. It does not end well for your kids. And you're playing it out 10 or 20 or 30 years into their future, and you're seeing the therapy bills just rack up, and you're like, this story, this story doesn't end well. Proverbs 27, 12 says this, the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple Keep going and pay the penalty. Two people, same scenario, two responses, two radically different outcomes. The prudent person looks down the path. They look down the path, they play the movie, and they see danger ahead. Hey, right now, things are fine. In this moment, at this part of the path, it's okay. But when I play this forward, I see there's something that I don't want in my life. Like, I don't want to end up there. And when they see that, they do something about it. They take refuge. They change direction. They see something. And because of what they see, they do something. But the simple, remember that person? Not necessarily trying to blow up their lives, but just at times seeming to not know any better. Instead of seeing and doing, rather than playing the movie, they what? What are these words? They keep going. They keep going. It'll be okay. You'll see. It'll all work out. I know that looks like it could be bad up there, but it's not going to happen to me. I'm a statistical outlier. This is going to turn out wonderfully for me, right? And they play the movie or they see down the road, but they just keep going and they become their own worst enemy. Preemptive habit number one. Learn to play the movie, play the movie, play the movie, play this forward to the so-called unintended consequences. Now, each week I want to give you a few questions as we end to ask yourself, and I hope they kind of stick with you. And, and the question that goes with this first preemptive habit is a question that has become really one of the most important questions in my life. I ask it 
all the time. I see my life or think through things through this lens. It, is, it has been behind some of my best decisions I've ever made, but it also plays through this like day-to-day -day moments as I'm quieting certain struggles that I have. And the question is this, what story do I want to tell with my life? What story, if I play this movie, what story do I want, how do I want this movie to end? Roll credits, what was the point? Was it a good story? What story do I want to tell with my life? And with every decision, here's the thing, you're writing the script of that story. You're writing the script for the story that will be your life. And it could be a story of fear, or it could be a story of courage. It could be a story of victimhood, or it could be a story of heroism and overcoming. It could be a story of petty ambitions and a primarily self-focused life, or it could be a story of great love and attachment and community and contributions, but here's the thing. You get to choose which story it will be, and in fact, you are choosing every single day what story you will tell with your life. It's a question that gives you context. It's a question that gives you some distance, a long view. Like right now, it all seems so confusing and there's appetites, right? And there's desire and there's emotion and I want A so bad. But when I play that out, when I look down the road and ask myself, well, what story do I really want to tell? It gives context. It gives distance to this particular step. Singles, single people. There's a story that you will tell your future one and only. What story do you want to tell? Parents, parents, you are writing the story that your children will tell. You know that, right? Years from now, when they start to tell their story, they're going to start with you, with you. And you know that's true because that's how you start your story, right? Years from now, when they start their story, it's going to start with what you said and with what you did and how you lived and how you responded to pivotal circumstances and crises and crossroads in your life. And your story will either inspire them to greatness and impart to them courage and fortitude for life, or it'll be a cautionary tale and one that they never want to replicate, but it will be a part of their story. What story would you like them to tell? Now, that's a great question. That right there is a great question. And even if you're not sure what you believe about God or faith or Jesus or Bible, that is a great question that will keep you from becoming your own worst enemy. But if you call yourself a Christian, I'm going to add another point to this that to me is a very, very big point because someday, someday you will tell your story to God. I believe that. Do you believe that? Someday you will tell your story to God. The Apostle Paul, one of the most influential followers of Jesus in the first century and frankly throughout history, wrote this one time. He said, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. In other words, someday you will stand before the one who gave you your life, the one who created you, the one you cannot game or smoke or spin or shine, and you will tell your story. And my point has nothing to do with heaven or hell or fear of judgment or anything like that. You will stand before your heavenly father and you will give an account of your life to him. And I just want to tell you, you want that to be a good story, friends. You want that to be a good story. So what story? What story do I want to tell with my life? For years, uh, and, I, and I told you this has been such a big question for me, for years my wife and I had this ongoing conversation about adoption and we began the conversation when we got married. Actually, we were talking about adopting from the very beginning. My brother has lived most of my life in Africa, and he's, he had adopted. And I always thought, you know, maybe, so, wouldn't it be cool? And I kind of want to do that too. And maybe like after we have a few kids of our own, and, and I wonder if we should. And, and we're like, what if we were to adopt? And we'd have this conversation, and it was always to adopt someone that probably wouldn't be adopted by someone else, uh, to, 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 to bring somebody in our home who might be overlooked by others. And the conversation, it was always fun to have, but it always got tabled. Like, well, let's pick this up another time. And it got tabled by me because it's very expensive. It's totally life-changing. 
and it's risky. I don't know what you know about adoption world, but adoptions can go badly in a lot of ways, very, very badly. Of course, having your own children can go very badly as well. And I loved, I like, I loved my two kids and I loved our family and I loved what we had. I was like, why mess with that? And my life is already complicated enough. Why create additional complexity? And so we were, January 2005, coming home from a Big Bear family trip, family ski trip, and once again, the topic has come up. And again, I'm just paralyzed by uncertainty, seriously. Like, how do we know for sure is this God's will? Can we be certain of that? What if, what if, what if? And we began to talk about pros and cons and there was a long list on both sides and we played out worst case scenarios, but again, they can happen with your own children as well. And then we asked the question. We asked this question. Looking out 30 or 40 years, let's play the movie. Looking out 30 or 40 years, what story would we like to be able to tell about our lives? Story number one, you know, we thought about it a lot and we could have, we, could, we certainly could have, but it was expensive and it was complicated and, you know, we could never really be certain if we should, so we didn't. There's a story. Story number two, you know, we weren't sure. We were never really certain. There was this beautiful upside, but there was this really scary downside, but, but we got this child and here's how we loved her. And we pointed her to God, and then it ended up horribly or it ended up wonderfully, like however that ended up after that. But that's a story. Now, I'll ask you. You tell me. Which is a better story? Story number one or story number two? What's the better story? Well, number two. It's a better story. We, what story would we like to be able to tell with our lives at the end of this? Here's a question we asked, and the kids were in the back seat. What story do we want to tell with our kids? What is the better story for their lives? And which story after the end of our lives, which conversation of those two would we rather have with God? Immediately we knew. I mean, immediately. The years of fog were completely gone. All of the risk aversion and the fear and the uncertainty, second guessing, what if we, just gone in a moment. We drove down the mountain, emptied out our bank account, put a second mortgage on our house. A bunch of our friends joined in and helped us, including probably some of you sitting here, and we started the paperwork. And that question, that question over the years has become like one of the most important questions of my life, shaping probably my biggest and best decisions ever, keeping me from some of the dumbest moves ever, and influencing many, many of my day-to-day -day struggles. What story do I want to tell with my life? As you're, as, you're, as you're wrapping up, let me give you a few questions to kind of help you think through this. Where will this get me in the long run, really? Where does this right here get me in the long run, really? What story do I want to tell about this? What's the better story? What's the better story? What story would I be more proud of? And then you ripple that out a little bit further and you ask this question. What story will my kids eventually tell? Maybe you don't even have kids yet. Maybe you're never planning on having them. But if you are, your story, even before you have them, ripples into their lives. You know that, right? What story will my kids eventually tell? What will be the ripple effect of this into the stories of others around me? Because my life is intertwined and interconnected with how will this impact my community? How will this impact other people who know me and love me? If I walk down this path, what eventually will be my children's story that they tell? And then here's a couple more questions. What will be the story that others tell of me after I'm gone? Maybe for good or maybe just from the room. Like, what will, when I'm walking out or when I've passed on, what will be the story that others tell about my life and about this? And what is the story that I want to tell to God? Preemptive habit number one, play the movie. Play the movie. Learn to do this. Learn to do this. And you will not only avoid becoming your own worst enemy, you just might become your own best friend. However, huge timeout right here. However, there is a fly in the ointment. There really is. There is a flaw in the system. There is a bug in the software. There is a very good reason why this will not actually work for you. 
Not at all. Why this habit of playing the movie will be totally ineffective and unhelpful for you in your life. And the reason why it will not work for you. Well, you have to come back next week. That's where we're going. Don't miss part two of our series. Let me close for us in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just pray for all of us that, that this message, this idea lands on every one of us exactly where it needed to and not where you don't want it to. So would you please, because I know we've all got some pasts, we've got, all got things we're doing and facing, we've got futures we hope for, there are things that have already happened, paths that have already come to be. So I know this lands on us all in very different ways. I, I just ask, would you please give us all the wisdom to hear what we needed to hear today the wisdom to know what to do with it, would you give us please the grace to maybe step free from some paths, from some shame in the past that might hold us back? That's not where you wanna take us. Would you give us grace for our past and then would you give us the courage that we need to honestly face the paths that we're on and change the directions that we need to change? And I pray all of that in Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight as we kicked off this brand new series. Before you take off, I just want to say, uh, Scott told you about those Connect cards. We would love, love, love to hear from you. So uh, please take a moment and uh, fill that out. You can drop those Connect cards in the baskets on your way out. Our guest services teams will be out there as maybe you're heading out to pick up your kids. If you're giving today, there are always lots of ways to give online on the app. The envelopes can be placed in that basket as well. And then, hey, don't forget to join us next week for our Super Bowl Saturday night. It's going to be a lot of blast. Wear your favorite team jerseys, whatever the team, whatever the sport, whatever the level of play. And uh, we're going to have a great time next weekend as we continue our series, How Not to Be Your Own Worst Enemy. Don't miss part two next week. God bless you guys. Have a fantastic rest of your weekend. <laughs>